Hello and welcome to Inside Intercom. On this week's show, I'm talking to a fellow podcaster, the 20 Minute VC himself, Harry Stebbings. Harry founded the 20 Minute VC, the world's largest independent venture capital podcast. He's a contributor for TechCrunch, and in 2021, he raised a duo of funds for 20 VC, the venture capital fund he launched off of his show's success. On today's show, we're talking shop on the perils of podcasting, what lessons Harry has learned from his biggest guests, why the movie The Social Network was instrumental in his VC journey, and a lot more. Let's not waste any time and head straight over to studio to meet Harry Stebbings. Harry, you're very welcome to the show. Delighted to have you. Yes, it's good to be here, Liam. Thank you for having me, my friend. <laughs> okay, so I want to start by saying, like, when I was 12 or 13, I think, I, I was watching, like, the special edition re-release of Star Wars when it came out in the cinema again and, you know, pretending to have lightsaber battles on my way home. And so that movie had, like, a massive impact on me. And for you, there was, like, a very different kind of movie that was a big inspiration. I'm wondering what it was. I mean, that sounds a bit dodgy, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I was I was 13 uh, or 12 or whatever it was when I was in the cinema and I saw The Social Network, which is obviously the hailed movie about Facebook's growth story. And I saw Peter Thiel invest in Facebook from his hedge fund, Clarium Capital, which is a scene that everyone else forgets and it's completely really forgotten in the movie. But it was the first time a little kid in London had ever seen venture capital like me. And so I, I went home, I read everything I could on venture from the early writers. Remember... This was when venture was not cool, when there were very few writers. So Brad Feld, Roger Her Ehrenberg, David Hornick, Mark Suster, and I read all of their blocks. And, you know, I fell in love with venture even more. And when I was 18, I was faced with the prospect of law school. And I thought, well, you know, I want to be a, I want to be a VC. I believe in the personalization of capital. I believe that people become more important than firms. And... Actually, uh, distribution is more important than ever. So why don't I interview these people? Hopefully I'll be charming enough. And then one of them will give me a job. And so I, so I did that and, you know, believe it or not, it worked. <laughs> I thought my first job was as an entrepreneur in residence. I can't wait to have children one day and tell them that. <laughs> so what is it about, like, if we jump back a bit, like, what is it about VC that you really love? Yeah, I think, honestly, for me, it's the ability to do many things in a day. I get quite bored doing one thing only. You know, I used to run just the media company, which is 20 VC, and I love media and I love content and I love the team here. But just doing that, it's not, you don't learn at the same rate, I find, than I do when I do investing as well. You know, I'm learning about you know, health tech, I'm learning about, you know, next generation of GPT-4, I'm learning about, you know, whatever that may be. And so it gives you this breadth of learning. Also with the people that you work with, not only the material itself, I learn from the founders that I invest in, hopefully they learn from me too. But it's just the breadth of exposure that you see is unparalleled. And I, I love investing as well. I think people really mistake it with me. They're like, oh, Harry, the podcaster who like invests as well. No, you don't get it. I fundamentally leverage media to be a better investor. I did media to invest. I didn't happen to move into investing. So like, can you help me connect the dots between that initial kind of boyhood inspiration to deciding to set up the podcast? You know, what happened kind of in between on the lead up to the podcast? Well, I, I honestly, I read all these blogs and I was like, wow, there's actually a generation of really awesome investors. And I mentioned some of them there. But when I go onto Tim Ferriss or any of the mainstream media channels, I see, you know, Ben Horowitz or Mark Andreessen, and they are fantastically smart, wise individuals. But there are many more. Why aren't we covering this generation of very interesting people who've seen booms and busts like I haven't and seen incredible company growth like I haven't and many haven't? Why are they not being interviewed? And so it was like, hey, there's this generation of like unloved investors. I know it's very different now. <laughs> that are not getting any interest or exposure. And there's a lot we can learn from them. And so, you know, I went and thought that I'm going to do it. And I honestly... I think, you know, the most important thing is the first step. So many people fail in life just because they don't take the first step. And the first step, it's important, I think, to tie to like financial commitment. I remember buying the domain name 
And it was like 30 pounds. Liam, when I was 18, <laughs> right, 30 pounds was not, not I, that was Yeah, like, it was a lot. And then I bought a microphone for 50 pounds. I mean, now I'm in. Like, I, I have to be in here. And so that really made a, a, a kind of commitment difference to me. And then I think the other thing is, you know, the biggest frustration to me, oh, Liam, it is so annoying. I'm going off on a tangent. Uh, people who say, oh, Harry, you know, you're great at content. You're great at the show, but it's just not me. I could never do that. No, that's absolutely a cop out. I'm sorry. It's pathetic. The truth <laughs> is I was terrible too. It was the first show. I had no idea what I was doing. I sound like a BBC newsreader from the 60s. <laughs> you know what? It's like going to the gym. You put the reps in and you get better and better and better. And you keep practicing and you keep doing more and more. I think, you know, I often think this one, but it's like, you know, you get rewarded in public for what you do in private. And it's just important to put those reps in. Yeah, yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right because th that's the thing I get asked the most. You get sick, like hearing your own voice, but like after a certain point, you don't even hear it anymore. It doesn't, you know, it's not like that thing where you were a kid and you record yourself and you're like, oh, oh I can't believe I sound like this. You know, you just it's once you get over that hump, it's actually like you say, it's it's more, it's way more smooth sailing. Yeah. But you have to get over that hump. Yeah. And you have to appreciate that actually, you know what, you probably will be embarrassed by your first V1 <laughs> yes. and you will get better over time. My yeah. mother's, you know, now becoming a Pilates instructor and she's really fucking nervous. Am I allowed to swear? I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but whatever. Go for it. Fine. Yeah. She's really nervous. I'm like, you know what? You probably will be quite bad when you start. And she's like, that's not the advice that I thought you were going to give me. <laughs> and I'm like, no, but you will get better and better and better. And you will look back and realize that actually you've grown and you've developed. And that is how we are. Just keep going. And like a lot of VCs, I think that we hear about kind of fell into it. But would you kind of recommend people should be a little bit more strategic about it? Yeah, I, I, you know, the one thing that I also don't have any time for. Oh, I really want to do venture, but I don't know. Like, you know, it's really it's really difficult to get in. No, it's fucking not. And I'm being, I'm being, I know I'm really just it's like 5 p.m. on a Friday, so I'm going for it. But like, I'm really sorry. I will tell you the secret to get into venture right now. I guarantee you no one will do this. I will give anyone listening a job if they do. Okay. So number one, look at profiles of investors that you want to work with. Find five. Look at the types of deals that they have done. Okay. You can see stage, sector preference, lead, not lead, board seat, not board seat. And then every month, send them three deals that are aligned to the stage and sector that they invest in with a paragraph. I'm not asking for a memo, a paragraph on each on why you think specifically it is interesting. And like, do that for six months running, 18 companies. You may not hear anything back for three months. I guarantee you, if you do that to those five people, you will get at least two job offers. If I got that for six months, I would give someone a job at the end. You know what? I've tweeted it. I've told people no one has done it. People don't oh. do the follow up. Well, this is it. We're putting it out there now. <laughs> Anyone listening, now's the time to do it. No one has done it. When you started, what was the actual interviewing like? You know, we're talking about kind of trying stuff out at first and, and being nervous. And there must have been some kind of apprehension of talking to all these kind of, you know, figures from the world of tech and VC at the start. Do you know what? I always found it much more nerve wracking speaking to my own age group. I wasn't really very nervous. Not not in arrogance. I'm I'm still well, less so now. But when, you know, when I was twenty, I was terrified going into like party. Oh, I couldn't do that, and I'd still be a little bit apprehensive now, actually. But getting on a call with with you know Guy Kawasaki, who was my first or <laughs> interview. <laughs> 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 or, or, you know, any of the other early interviews. Honestly, we had an agenda. We had a shared passion up front that was, you know, topics that we wanted to discuss. It was kind of set. I, I found the social with my own age much, much harder. You know, I think I've always grappled with insecurity. I was, I was very obese and fat when I was young. I had eating disorders. And so I've always kind of felt not good enough socially with my own age group. So no, I didn't get nervous there. But yes, I was very nervous with my own age group. 
again, I think you just get used to it with the reps. Then in terms of podcasting, like I've been podcasting since, ooh, I don't know, 2007, I think it was like a long time. And it seems like it's taken a long time for kind of podcasting to catch up with the rest of the world. But why do you think it kind of resonates so much in the tech space? Well, one, it's inherently aligned to tech. <laughs> you know, we understand the app, we understand the distribution channels. Where, you know, people forget like everyone in tech is just always permanently on Twitter pretty much. And most other industries are actually not. And so I think that's that's one thing. I think the big thing, like honestly, though, with podcasts and with content more broadly, is a couple of things. One, people fundamentally don't understand the right ratio of distribution to creation. Like I used to think if you spend an hour creating content, you should spend three hours distributing it. And what does that mean? You interview me today, right? I'm on several boards. You should send it to all the founders that I'm on boards with. You should send it to the other board members I'm on boards with. Hopefully I'm close to them if I'm you know, a semi-decent human being. I have team members, many team members in the media company and the fund. You have to look for people who are incentivized to share a piece of content. You have to build a community of ambassadors that will promote your content for you. And then when it goes live, you absolutely send it to them and you personalize it. You do the 595. Hi, Liam. I hope you're well and the kids are great, blah, 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 personal. Paste, which is the show, some little bit about it, whatever. And then at the end, you say, send my love to Des at Intercom. He's such a great guy. And then you're like, wow, fantastic. It's so kind of, yes. But now you've just added 40 people who will promote your show. That's really, really important. So I don't think people get the right, right idea in terms of the ratio of creation to distribution, one. And then people don't fundamentally understand channel specialization, especially today. I, I see all these companies with like marketing teams. I was chatting to someone earlier. They've got a social media person. Well, how ridiculous. What, ta- what it takes to win on TikTok is so different to what it takes to win on LinkedIn or what it takes to win on Facebook. We have individual teams that are absolute scientists at all of them. I always joke that we're kind of podcast and most of our people should work at NASA, um, <laughs> <laughs> which might be a misallocation of today's bright mind and resources. But like it, channel specialization today is more important than ever. And I find that is another very misunderstood kind of thought piece in content step. Has there been a podcast in space yet? Maybe that's maybe you could be the first person to do that. I don't think there has. I, I would love to. If Elon wants to do it with me, I'm game. <laughs> <laughs> and, and kind of like you were saying there, you know, like anyone starting a podcast mm. seems to have this dream of instantly making a fortune off it, you know, which is obviously a lot harder than people think. Um, like, What approach did you take to monetizing the 20 Minute VC? Uh, well, number one, you... You know, unless you have an existing brand or you know, f- distribution channel, you know, like some do, or like many celebrities do. You, you know, I didn't make money for two years. I, I, I think it took two years before I gained 2,000 plays per show, which is not very much. I mean, that really is quite a long time. It's about 300 shows. So I think, one, people fundamentally give up too soon. It will take two years or 18 months before you actually will be able to make money on it. Two, the money you make on it will not be great. I hate to break it to you. (laughs) Three, the massive problem that people make is they're not specific enough. Liam, I have so many people say, I'm starting a podcast on entrepreneurship. What? (laughs) Terrible. You know what it should be? I'm starting a podcast on zero to one in terms of gaining your first 100 customers. I'm going to tell the stories of the greatest companies in the world, how they gain their first 100 customers. That's really interesting, actually. Well, I'm going to tell the story of how the biggest D2C brands form partnerships with the biggest traditional retailers. Super specific. You know what? If you get a thousand true fans in that sense, trust me, you can expand and add ancillary products. If you look at us, we did 20 VC. Now we obviously interview founders. Now we have 20 sales, 20 product, 20 growth. We eat more and more of the operator stack. And now, you know, we get, fuck, I don't know, 25 million downloads a month or whatever it is. And so like, Start super specific. Don't expect the money. The payback period is long. How did I start the money? As I said, it didn't come for 18 months. And I remember I'm very good friends with the first sponsor ever. It's a hiring company in Hong Kong who paid me $5,000. And I just felt like the richest man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's funny, you know, because people do kind of like think they're going to I'll do my first episode and where can I get my first sponsor to give me that money? And like you say, their podcast is 
their idea behind it is just like, I'm just going to interview like interesting people. Like literally that's the pitch. I'm going to interesting, interesting people. There's nothing beyond that. I never did it for the money, Liam. Yeah. I yeah. still, I still don't do it for the money. Yeah. Like I, I do it because I love it. I think it's an important thing, which is to understand your, your kind of reason for being, which is like, I don't know if you've read the parable of the businessman and the fisherman. Um, all right, I'll tell it to you. Uh, there's a fisherman lying on a beach and he's smoking and he's got a beer and he's looking out at the beautiful sea. And this businessman comes to him and says, what are you doing lying on the beach? You could be out fishing and making more money. And he goes, and, and, and then what would I do? And he goes, and then you could hire more fishermen, catch them more fish and make even more money. And the fisherman goes, huh, and then what would I do? And the businessman goes, and then you could buy a big ship, catch the most fish ever, IPO the company, make a ton of money, and then you could lie on the beach, have a beer and a cigarette. And the fisherman goes, and what the fuck do you think I'm doing now? <laughs> and the point of me telling that story is there is no other way I would rather spend my time than the way I have done today. I just went for a walk with my mother. I had a great board meeting earlier. I had a great meeting with a new investment we're making. I'm having a great chat with you now. I'm doing an interview later. Like that is my reason for being, and it helps m inform a lot about how I spend my time. That said, you you've interviewed like an insane amount of people on your show. What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from your guests? Because, like you say, that's you know that's kind of why you wanted to talk to them in the first place. <laughs> wow! Well, I mean, what have you learned from three thousand shows in ninety thousand <laughs> minutes? Yeah, if you oh, can condense that into oh, a, a thirty-second clip. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the irony is you've learned that there's no right way to do venture. Everyone has their own way. And I made this mistake early on in my venture career. I thought I had to be analytical. I thought I had to be numbers based. And you know what? I'm shit at numbers and I'm shit at cohort analysis, but that's not me. Me is having the biggest network in the world, having the best switchboard for connecting the right people at the right time. Me is loving like true interaction, deep and meaningful conversations with people, winning the entrepreneur eye to eye. That's me. So like lean into your strengths. And I, I think this with hiring too, I look for the pointiness in people, which is like, I don't care if you're shit at nine out of 10 things, but what are you really fucking world-class at? And then I'm going to double down on that. The truth is not many people are really, really world-class at something. And so that that's what I always look out for. What have, what have I learned beyond that? Um, you know what? It's an interesting one. No one's really free. The only people who are really free are those that don't have a boss. So you'll look at all these famous VCs, they will have a boss. <laughs> they all have LPs and they are our bosses. And then you look at people like Emil Michael, who is the former chief business officer at Uber, who had an amazing show with me. He does not have a boss. And that meant he could say pretty much whatever he wanted. And he was fantastic. So everyone has a boss. I've also learned a couple of things, which is, and I've been imbued on me by some of the guests, which is, mm -hmm. One I love and I think to a lot, it's, you're never wrong to do the right thing. And it's like in every situation that's tough, I'm like, well, what's the right thing? Okay, that's hard, but I'm not wrong to do it. I think about that often. I, I think, often think also, you know, I, I got taught this, I can't remember if it was Howard Marks or Bill Gurley or Michael Eisenberg, but they said, you know, nothing's ever as good or as bad as it seems, this too shall pass. And they were talking about, obviously, markets and market downturns, which I, I think about often. And so there's a lot of like tidbits, which have really informed how I think. One of my closest mentors, Mark Evans, taught me one. It's not from the show, but I love it. It's a mm -hmm. Maya Angelou quote, which is, you know, it's not what you say. It's not what you do. It's how you make people feel that is important. And the truth is, Liam, every meeting I want you to leave and go, wow, that was really, that was interesting. That was fun. I'm going to remember that meeting. It's how you make people feel that is important. And I really think to that. Something you mentioned there of this too shall pass kind of makes me think of the tech landscape at the minute changing, you know, it's obviously changed dramatically in the past few months. How is the downturn affecting the VC space? Um, <laughs> I mean, it depends, to be quite honest. Mm. It depends what stage you're in and it depends what your... LP structure is. So we might be getting two VC like, but if you are in a tier one brand or have tier one LPs, 
you're continuing to deploy as you always have done because you have no fear of fundraising again. You know that if you come back next year, no matter what macro environment we're in, you're still going to be able to raise. So you're going to deploy probably a little bit more cautiously, but you're going to continue to deploy as you always would do and have done. You know, and very luckily, that's where 20 VC is. We've got great investors in us. And so super lucky in that. Important to always remember, you know, fundamentally, investors have to continue investing throughout market cycles. So that that's some, but then there are another class of VC, which is, you know, bluntly where you're not sure that you're going to be able to raise your next fund. And then it, it's a very challenging environment, bluntly. And, you know, you do pause deployment in a lot of ways. And we've seen that a lot. And so I think that's happened. Uh, weirdly, you know, you see price inflation in some weird areas. You know, a lot of multi-stage funds have moved earlier and earlier because they want to still deploy capital, but they don't want to deploy the 25 million Series A. And so they're much less price sensitive. They're increasing the supply of capital at pre-seed and seed. And so the price is actually going up, frustrating and challenging. Series A's and B's, difficult. Best companies are getting their rounds done by internal existing investors. So there's adverse selection on those that are raising. They probably don't have support of their internals, and they're not the 0.11% that we do want to be investing in. And then the Series C and D, all the multi-stage funds are like, you know what? 2, 3x, I will take that safety. 10x, I don't need right now. If there's less secure and it's 10x and more secure 2 to 3x, I'd rather have this. And so you're seeing this kind of flight to safety from the multi-stage funds to the 2 to 3x, which is actually causing price inflation from there. So it's it's a challenging time, I think, to be investing. I, I said the other day to our team, I think the worst time to be investing will be the next six months. But I think the next six, five years will be the best time to be investing. We have not had global problems like we do today, Liam, for, you know, I think hundreds of years. I think the world is in a really, really challenging situation. But technology is the only salvation. And if that is the case, then you know we should be best positioned to invest in a golden age of innovation. So what's next for you? Do you have any kind of big plans or projects coming up? I know you always have something on the go. I mean, that it's, it's <laughs> so many. I think I think honestly it's very simple. I want to continue loving what I do every single day, as I as I always have done, which is very lucky. And then I think the other thing I would say is like, just continue working with amazing people I respect and admire. I think the people you surround yourself with is kind of who you are and who you become. And so ensuring that I, I love my team, I respect my team. And I, I think really importantly, I'm not into a lot of the new age woke management techniques. Sorry for everyone who is, but like, it's really important. My team feels safe. They can come to me with anything. And I, I love leading them actually i didn't expect to enjoy leadership i thought it was like oh, boring it gets in the way of execution love leadership and i want to build the best highest performing team so i think we're one percent of the way there and you just got to keep fucking fighting man brilliant well li listen harry thank you so much for joining me today it's been a pleasure man it's been great thank you so much for having me and i really enjoyed it i hope you enjoyed my conversation with harry stebbings Intercom co-founders Des Trainer and Owen McCabe have both appeared on episodes of The 20 Minute VC, and the links to those episodes are in the show description. I'll be back next week with another great episode, but in the meantime, if your ears are hungry for more, we have an archive of hundreds of sparkling conversations with everyone from HubSpot CEO Yamini Rangan to Andrew Chu, a general partner of Andreessen Horowitz. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. This is Inside Intercom.